appeals several times in the verses to elders. Those are the ones with experience. They're the ones who are respected. Uh, they will likely respond to his message and they'll share it with others. So the opening comments are there for a reason. Hear this, verse 2, you elders, listen all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. Richard Rogers, when we studied this under him, made the comment that he's talking about five generations here. He goes back one year and then another to fathers and forefathers and then children would be the present generation and the next generation Tell it to their children and tell it to the next generation. So this is something that is unlike anything that's ever happened in five generations. And he's asking them to remember that, but also to be aware of that. Uh, two years back and three years forward. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. And what the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Uh, some suggest that there's different varieties here of locusts, different levels, different types. I'm not sure that's necessary for our discussion to figure that out. People a lot smarter than us have it. Uh, there are young locusts and older locusts, so it's it's a real situation, but it's not necessary for our meaning. Uh, let's talk about sovereignty for a moment. It has to be discussed in such a setting. My best definition of sovereignty is you know, sovereignty of God is that he either causes everything to occur or he allows it to occur. And this is one that he causes. God's sovereignty is at work in the lives of us at all time. And he has power to do what he wants coming in and out of life circumstances. And this is one of the times where he causes something to occur. It's definitely not a natural thing. Now, that's not to say there aren't locust plagues, and there are even locust plagues today, from what I understand in some places, but not like this one. Not one that would be greater than five generations of people's experience. Uh, my question, how do we know which is natural and which is caused by God? Can we know? And do we need to know in order to be open to learn the lesson or to be seeing it and to be called back? You remember what most evangelicals said the day after 9-11? What was the major comment besides this is terrible and oh no and what's next? What did they say? This is God punishing our country. And they brought up all the things in our country that are unnatural, sinful, and we ought to know better as a Christian nation. But they immediately associated it with God causing it so as to condemn the sinful nature of America. Did you hear that? And would you agree that that's true? I'm open to it, but I'm going to wait till I get to heaven and ask. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> talk to my dad when you get there, Steve. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they, they, if you talk to some people like that about what happened, it can be a big turnoff about Christianity. A big turnoff. Yeah. 
because then the, the whole discussion will evolve into well, why did God allow this to happen? And why, you know, there's no way to know for sure. Really. Yeah. And in and in any way, we're trusting him to do if it was him, it was, if it wasn't, we trust him. Yeah. Right. I was thinking it was nine Muslim men from Saudi Arabia who did this. And they weren't guided by God. Ishmael. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, I understand a year later that our government spent, I, the last I heard it was like $750,000 to have some company go in and determine why the towers came down. I would have done it for a hundred. <laughs> for a hundred dollars. Two airplanes flew into it. They released millions of gallons of fuel and it caught on fire. And I mean, such stupidity followed that in other areas. Uh, I know, Rich, I saw a hand, did you? I, I was just going to say, I think if God's going to punish us, he's going to tell us he's going to punish us first. So I would look for someone to speak up for God and say, if we don't change, he's going to do this particular calamity. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't really see that. So you have to be careful if you're saying 9-11 was a punishment from God. If he didn't, yeah. he may have allowed it, but I don't necessarily think that uh, yeah. I don't it was from God. Burn, happy birthday late, by the way. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I was going to say, you know, we're subject to the sins of others. Uh, their actions causes other reactions. Yeah. And, you know, we're not, you know, immune from it. So what someone else does affects us as well. You know, your sins may affect somebody else or whatever. Absolutely. So, you know, it's, and, and God gives it all of us free will. And that free will, you know, determines on what a person does or whatever. Or, you know, so to say that it's uh, God acting upon us, well, if that's the case, there's a lot of countries that's going to be getting smacked down. Something's yeah. going to happen. So, but no, mm -hmm. it's the actions of man mm -hmm. that causes a lot of other adverse reactions. That affects everybody. Evil acts that affect innocent people. Yes. And free will is the key. People decided to do this and it had an effect upon us. I don't believe God caused it at all. But I know a whole lot of people wanted to suggest that it was God's actions against sinful people in America. And I think that's one reason why God says, you know, hey, you know, vengeance is mine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I know a very famous football, <clears throat> college football coach, and I've heard a particular political party, but maybe both of them would look at it the same way, that would say, don't ever miss lessons that can be learned in spite of failure. Uh, and another way to say it, don't fail to use a crisis mm -hmm. And sometimes to uh, perpetuate a, an agenda, and I think political parties will do that. Uh, turn to Luke 13 for a moment. I don't see the need to rush, but let's learn the lesson. Because God tells us how to respond to things that happened in our life. And he's not asking us to determine who caused it. And that's what Luke 13 gives us two examples. I appreciate Jesus teaching us this so we can lay aside all the surmising and, and expectation and be careful not to say something bad about God in the process. There were some present at that time, Luke 13, who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And we have no other record of this anywhere. And Jesus tells us something from history. And it's Galileans who Pilate killed, and apparently they were going to offer sacrifices. 
And so Pilate killed Galileans, and the blood of sacrifices was mixed with their blood. So you see the picture? Did God cause it? Why did it happen? Probably an evil pilot, but that's not what he answered. Jesus answered, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Is this a result of greater sin on the part of some compared to others? Is this the result of sin? He said, I tell you, no. And so that's the first lesson. And the second lesson, he repeats, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Let's read the next two verses because he says the same thing. Then let's be sure we know what he's saying. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? So it's 18 people, a tower fell on them, and they died because of it. Were they more guilty than others? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. And here's what I think he's saying. I haven't had anyone misunderstand it or disagree, and it seems to fit everything that I've been taught from a variety of people. And this isn't new to you, I'm sure. What Jesus is saying is don't try to determine sinfulness or guilt or whatever. But if you think that there's sin in your life that could cause something like this to occur, if this makes you think of your relationship with God, and you realize there's sin that needs to be repented of, repent. If the day after 9-11, if you felt like God might have done this, but you don't know, probably not, but if it makes you think of sin, what do you do with sin? You repent. You repent. It says it twice. It's not greater sin, less sin, that these two events, tragic, and they cause death of innocent people. One, a typical physical circumstance, another by a, a ruler who hated Galileans going to offer sacrifices. If something happens in your life and you think, oh no, what did I do wrong? Have I committed sins? He would say, stop doing that. If you have sin, repent. Mm -hmm. Repent of your sin. Cause of circumstances in your world, cause of circumstances in other worlds, if it makes you see God, see yourself, and there's sin that you're concerned about, repent of it. Is that a healthy response? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it really the only spot response we could give? Trying to determine did God cause this or allow it? What's the answer? Yes. <laughs> I think even even if we don't go to what have I done or, or anything like that, or did God cause this, let every situation uh, bring you closer to God, whether it's a good happening or a bad happening. And they're always happening. So, and, and the word that I like what she said, and sin separates us from God. So if we want a close relationship with God, regularly deal with sin mm -hmm. that might be in your life. Mm -hmm. We are sinning saints. The book of 1 John teaches us that. So deal with sin. And if something's happening and it makes you think about your relationship with God, we are sinning saints. And walk in the light. But if there's something more specific, deal with it without trying to figure, figure it out. Uh, we're, we're probably going to blame God for something that's not him. And that's not what we would want to do if we try to figure it out. Could be. 
but he allows evil people to free will make decisions that affect innocent people. It's part of life. Huh? So th this may have been a bigger issue back then than we think because the first part of John 9, when he's yeah. trying to heal the blind man, absolutely, the disciples' natural response was, this man is blind. So which one of his parents was sinful That's right. to cause this man to be blind? And he said, neither one of them were sinful. But why did it happen? The next verse, so that God might be glorified. Yep. Yeah. It wasn't due to sin, but Jesus was using this situation. It was real. It was tragic to glorify God. Good came from it because of what he did. He healed the blind man. But that's the cross-reference. If you don't write in your Bible, consider writing in it. John 9, Luke 13 teaches a similar lesson. The sovereignty of God. So did he cause a locust plague? Yes. No question. Was it the worst that they would ever hear or see in five generations? Absolutely. Why would he do such a thing? Destroy a crop that fed people, a drought that followed the locust plague. And then he sent his prophet to explain it. So then he sends good. a prophet to explain it, mm -hmm. and he points it toward Assyria that's going to do something similar in years ahead. Why does he do something like this here? Somebody say it. He cares about his people. And sometimes it took such an action. Tough love. Tough love, Terry calls it. <laughs> That's really tough love. But because they had sin, too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They'd sin in his punishment, if you will, but it's to call them back, it's to warn them. Uh, it's the message of his love. And he does things because he loves us. Uh, if someone's doing something and you could take an action on their behalf to stop it or prevent something from happening, and you're very lukewarm and neutral in that situation. How much love does that show that you have toward that person? It's love that acts. It sometimes brings about a discipline. You stop doing that and go sit over here in the corner to the four-year-old grandchild. <laughs> You're not watching TV the rest of the day because of what you just did. That's love. To do nothing, lukewarm is a lack of love. And, of course, Hebrews, as we studied several weeks ago now, it's God loving us when he disciplines us. And what, what father doesn't discipline the child? God loved them so much, he could not let them continue to do what they were doing. Uh, do we need something so drastic? Don't we hope not? <laughs> Don't we hope not? And David, you've been patient. No, that's okay. Uh, but so, if I want to make a couple of points, and Dude. I want to say, so we need to remember Joel is one of those only prophets in the Bible that does not specifically accuse Israel of any sin. Mm -hmm. so usually, every every prophet says, "Okay, you have done this sin and this. You have you have rejected me, or you have you know not taken care of my people." So, Joel does not say anything. Does not specifically say. The only thing is that Joel talks about. A prophecy in the future. He talks something in the future, yeah. and to me, the way I understand it is like, like Christ, you know, talking with parables to to get a heavenly meaning. They need to give them something earthly that they understand. So Absolutely. this invasion of invasion of locusts, the way I understand it, is something in the past that had happened, you know, in the book of Exodus. So he brings something that they already know, they are familiar with, and yeah. tell them this has happened before. Remember, and you need to repent because. What is going to happen next on the day of the Lord? It might be much worse. Yeah. So it just it's it's trying to to get their attention by something they are familiar and they know they have lived it and says and has come through generation of the word of mouth and finally said, "No, wait, this don't forget it. You still have to tell to children, children, that because it can happen, and you need to repent before yeah. the day of the Lord comes." And we know in the Old Testament, Assyria and Babylon captured them. They went into Egyptian bondage. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and God allows those things because he took smaller numbers of people to win battles against huge numbers of enemies uh, many times. Um, if we don't say anything else or learn anything from this, let's be certain that we are multiple, teachable, and very pliable to see and notice our relationship with God. Don't take it for granted, but also don't don't push it away as if it's so good that I'm okay. Uh, and that doesn't mean we're to use false guilt, but just be open and pliable to where you will acknowledge things in your life when things come to mind. And who knows where they're coming from? How many of you have ever been driving and somebody cuts in on you and you don't like it? It's <laughs> called in Florida's I-95 Rage. And there are people who have been shot and run into and fights have occurred because of road rage. But how many times does something happen and you weren't hurt, but it got your attention and you say, thank you, Father. Because what if something had happened? What if you hadn't been as quick or the brakes or whatever? We are so sensitive, hopefully, to not figure it out, just say, thank you, Father. And is there a better expression that we could use many times during our day than to say, thank you, Father, for blessings, but also warnings or remembrances of how fragile life is or whatever it is. To me, that's the message of Joel. Uh, that's the message of Luke 13 as well. Other observations before we read, huh? So I've noticed two things. One, COVID has made the driving situation worse. It seems like people have shorter tempers and worse driving. I can't understand the connection between COVID and driving, though. We're pinned up. we got to get out. But I've also noticed that kindness now is more noticed because people are so used to people being either cold or rude that when you're kind, it really makes an impression on people so this is our chance to really shine and make a bigger impression than we might have been able to otherwise so actually if you think about it if you're smart you can use COVID-19 as a tool for being kinder and having it be a bigger light yeah I agree yeah light is more noticeable in darkness yeah yeah oh yes yes verse five wake up you drunkards <coughs> And weep, well, all you drinkers of wine, well, because of the wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped <coughs> off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. And so he's talking about degrees of fierceness here, if you will, uh, leading to everything is laid waste. There's nothing left as far as vegetation and things of that nature. More like a virgin in sackcloth. Uh, I wrote in the margin what Richard said, someone who never married due to death at the altar. So at the last minute, a tragedy occurred, and they were not able to go forward in their marriage. Grieving for the husband of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined. The ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine, grapes, are dried up. The oil fails. Despair, you farmers. Well, you fine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up. The fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the joy of people is withered away. 
I got hungry, first of all, when I read it slightly. <laughs> and then I realized, wait, that's not what I'm supposed to be getting here. <laughs> but the other side of the coin is what he's saying. You are going to be hungry. And these things are not available. They are not there. Any joy, any celebration, even worship. Uh, the priest, everything is changed because of this. It's a major, major event that the prophet gives them. And what's the necessary response? What should be the natural response? My topic, my subtopic in the NIV is a call to repentance. It's a call to repentance. What does God want us to learn from such an event? We've already seen it. See yourself in light of him, and if there's sin, repent of it. The same message from Luke 13, a call to repentance. Put on sackcloth, O priest, and mourn. Well, you who minister before the altar, come spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. There's nothing to offer. There's, there's nothing to perform, if you will, the right of worship. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders, all who live in the land, to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Strength in numbers in such a situation. Surround yourself with others. Come before God and cry out to God. What a dreadful day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like a destruction from the Almighty. And that's the theme of this book, the day of the Lord. And we'll see it in the other two chapters, the day of the Lord. What day of the Lord is he talking about initially? There's an A and a B. What's the A version locust plague what's the greater version that it would also point us toward the day of the lord christ return second coming second coming and i would ask and the book will imply it without necessarily saying it outright is anything more important to you of greater importance, more on your mind, however else it needs to be said, than for you to be cognizant of your relationship to God as it relates to his second coming. What is more important in our mind than that? Is there anything? I see a few heads. You have to think about it and it's okay. No, shouldn't be shouldn't be and yet how many times the last what is this the third second wow. no, it's a, my well, it's watch is wrong it's the third how many times since august came into our calendar time have you thought about the second coming of christ i haven't until i thought about the book of joel and tonight's class I don't think he wants us to have it constantly on our mind to where we can't do other things, but it should always be in the back of our mind at least. Our relationship to God is everything. Being right, being in Christ, and being right. And again, it's not guilt. It's not fear. We're not serving out of duty. But this book and other books would just want us to be mindful about his second coming. Everything should eventually get there in the process, in our thinking, in our living. Kind of like navigation. You want to be in line and do your things, and do, but then always keep yourselves in line, going in the right place. Yeah. Not fear, like you said, not fear, not scared, not cowed, but... Yeah. Getting it right, We're trying to be right, and yeah. you know, being, being through the grace of, of God. Just being mindful of it. Mm -hmm. 
when you think about the second coming, is it uh, joyous thinking? If not, do something about yeah. it. Again, we have the ability. I don't know if I've said this here. Get ready for something that sounds absurd, but I envy those who know death is just around the corner. I really do. Because they know it's just around the corner, they can be especially ready. And I've said that to four people in the last six years who were within weeks of their death. This says, be sure you're right with God. You have the time. You know it's coming. You're closer than ever. Now, I don't know when I'm going, but I don't have that awareness the way I would if I were given six weeks. And it's a, it's a blessing to take advantage of, to be certain. To be certain. You want to go turn the ice maker on? So you'll think about it later. That noise in the background. Lindita's is going to get it. Uh, to know, to know would be a, a blessing, I think. And I'm not, I'm not fatalistic at all. I, I just think it, it would be a blessing to know. Why? Because you can't wait to get there. Fair enough. Um, observations, and if you're going to tell me I'm crazy, I'll listen to you. <laughs> we have to be ready so we don't have to get ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, be ready, right. but make sure. Be sure. Uh, shared it with my brother in the last year. Much younger than me. The first of the nine. And uh, he was ready. I told him, be sure you're ready. I hope he was. I hope he made it. Because he had some things he needed to deal with. Yeah. Huh? Sort of a sad note, too, because I've had two siblings pass away. And neither one of them were ready. It's by growing up in the church, good Christian parents, neither one of them were ready at all. They drifted away because the crossroad movement and other stuff. And yeah. Oh. Uh, other observations? I don't want us to be gloomy. <laughs> I'm not intending for that. I was thinking about. The Lord coming is, is a blessing. Has not the food been cut off before our very eyes? Verse 16, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruin. The granaries have been broken down for the grain has dried out. How the cattle bone, the herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of the sheep are suffering. To you, O Lord, I call. It's the prophet's prayer here. For fire has devoured the open pastures. Flames have burned up all the trees of the land. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up and fire has devoured the open pastures. And then he describes the locust plague. And he describes Describes it as if there's a galloping of cavalry, uh, cavalry, cavalry. Horses. I must have had too much sugar today. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, but he's using other known circumstances to create a sound awareness mm -hmm. and a, a eye awareness of what it would be like. Of what God is is trying to see. The day of the Lord is great. Verse 11b. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? I want us to be sure we see verse 12 of chapter 2. Even now declares the Lord. Return to me with all your heart. The fasting and weeping and mourning. Tear, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. This can be changed. You have a part to play in this circumstance. Um, 
Verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Uh, verse 17, let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. The thing that Richard Rogers mentioned, and I wrote it down, this is where men meet God without a sacrifice. This isn't necessarily the sacrificial place. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Isn't that a, an amazing reality? People living under the claim of Christianity, under the claim of obedience to God, but even the people who don't acknowledge God are going to say, where is their God? They're not living like there's a God in their life. Live like there's a God in your life, he's saying. Rend your heart, repent. He's a God that wants you to come back. He's gracious, compassionate, Slow to anger, abounding in love. And that's where I want us to end. I don't want us to see the negative. God always provides redemption in the morning. He always provides redemption. He reminds us of that in any and all circumstances. And I want us to be sure we finish with that tonight and we'll look at it. Some other lessons next week, and particularly the day of the Lord, perhaps. Observations. I have a speech I want to make before we leave. So, so I, living in California, have never actually hardly ever seen locusts here. So some people don't know about locusts. Locusts are about that big. Yeah, two or three and they're inches. about that wide. Okay, and if you see them in a tree, like thirty of them, they'll be making a soft sound in unison. And it sounds kind of like a UFO. They make strange noises. They're very good at destroying things by working together. And I've actually heard a recording one time of what it sounds like when locusts go through a field. And it sounds more mechanical than it does like insects doing it. They make this, this the sound of locusts going through a field and devouring it is scary. You may be very scary. The, the bark is gone. I mean, yeah. There's just no hope of a renewed life after they leave. Mm -hmm. uh, any of you seen the old, old movie, The Good Earth? The Good Earth. Yeah. The Good Earth. It has. <laughs> they tried to at least depict the locust plague. And it's a story of a uh, Chinese peasant man with family. And uh, I recommend you watching it. You'll enjoy it. Pearl S. Buck, The Good yeah. Earth. Go find it on, mm -hmm. on uh, YouTube. Good or old black and white, no less book. One of her great books put to put the movie. Uh, but the local flag is very much a part of it. Um, anything we need to say about what we said before we talk about prayer requests and how we prayer, then I need to make a short speech. Prayer requests? Huh? Are you asking for prayer requests? Yeah. Now? yeah. Uh, I spoke with Sandy Burroughs uh, just before coming, and she said that bread continues to decline. There's some days good, some not. But they do go to Sunday evening service because they don't, um, there are fewer people there, and most people don't wear masks. Use your protection. Yeah. But she thanked the church for the prayers. Fred Burrow. Several with COVID in our group. Two in the Walker family, Audrey so the youth group, slowly leaving it behind. I'll lead a prayer and then I want to make a statement. Thank you, Father, for the blessings we have in this life. We acknowledge they all come from you and we're thankful for them. Help us to never, never take them for granted. Help us to share them with others. 
help us to share the blessings and that information with others so they can perhaps see it in the, their own lives. Be with those who are in special need, with Fred and others, as we have so many in our thought process, in our prayer life. Most of us have a long list. Help them and be with them and provide what they need. Thank you for this opportunity to be reminded of your willingness to let us come home, of your traits of compassion, and tenderness, and love. We are so thankful for that. Help us to stay safe, to stay healthy, to find ways to serve you. Look for opportunities to teach others. Help us to see and know those who are looking for you. Make it as clear as possible as we want that. And thank you, Father, for the blessings of this day and of this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 My speech has